As we explained to you last week, one of our gravest difficulties in studies of this kind is a confusion of terminology. Because in the course of man's philosophical and religious history, many schools have arisen which devised systems essentially very similar, but in detail often confused by arbitrary definitions of specific terms. So we will begin this evening by trying to clarify some of these problems as they relate uh, to the bodies and constitution of man. We begin with those schools which have naturally and instinctively divided the compound nature of the human being into three parts. These three parts are referred to as spirit, soul, and body, or sometimes spirit, mind, and body. Under this rather general division, the human being is simply defined as existing with a spiritual ends or principle, a plus, usually represented by the term spirit, a negative or minus represented by the term body. And between these two extremes, a composite, complex structure of invisible energies forces and powers, which are all grouped together under the single term soul. Such a classification has more or less dominated Western thinking, and as a result, soul has come in theology to simply represent all the invisible parts of man except the divine spirit which is at the source of his existence. This definition, incidentally, has strangely carried <coughs> over into modern psychology, which perhaps unwittingly has borrowed the most prevalent theological concept. Thus, for psychology, man has a body and an invisible compound constitution, termed his psyche. And beyond that, if the psychologist is an outstanding idealist, he may affirm the existence of this X or unknown quantity, a spiritual principle or energy. As to the nature of man's subjective constitution, the invisible parts of himself, these are assumed by modern psychology to be one essential structure, divisible certainly into parts and levels, but all actually of one essential design, constitution or pattern, and therefore subject to therapy or analysis as a unit. Such analysis as might be bestowed upon one part of this psyche would therefore be applicable to another. And in the search for man's invisible constitution, it has been considered sufficient to assume that this one constitution is a single organ or organization of some kind. Now other schools, we're thinking for the moment of some of the old hermetic philosophers, that analyzed and arranged the bodies of man according to the four elements, assigning to fire, spirit, to mind, or to air, mind, to water, soul, to earth, body. Now some of the alchemists went further and announced the existence of a fifth element, which they called Azoth, and which they likened to an intangible spiritual ether, the energy or vitality of space. When they gave this fifth element to their pattern, they placed it at the top causing it to be analogous to spirit. Then they further distinguished the vehicles as air representing now mind, fire representing emotion, 
water representing the etheric or vital body and earth representing the corporeal body. Now this division is essentially that which we find in the writings of the German mystic Jacob Bain and it occurs in a large number of the medieval systems particularly those that came under the influence of the early Christian and Muslim mystics. Now in the East and in some other groups particularly the Egyptian the septenary division of man was recognized. Man was therefore composed of seven principles. Under such in the Hindu system we find the first or highest of these defined as Atma. Atma was the spiritual root equivalent to our term spirit. They then considered the second of these planes to be called Buddhi which was the sphere of universal cognition. This was their second word. They then took what is called the Manasa field and they divided it into the Rupa and Arupa Manas or the higher and lower or the lower and higher in that order uh, aspects of mind which gave them four divisions. They followed this by the two divisions of Kama that we referred to last week as Devakan and uh, Jamaloka. They then went to the which gave them six principles. They then descended to the etheric field and named the vital principle or vital body which gave them the seven. They never considered the body as a principle. It was always a vehicle or vehan or container of principles. This septenary division also arises among the Gnostics and we learned that we have traces of it in Neoplatonism in the visions and uh, symbols of Plotinus and Proclus. Thus you see we have quite a confused picture. Yet this confusion is rather in the arrangement of a pattern rather than in any uh, definite difference in the principles involved. It depends entirely upon the term, the school and the group to which you belong as to how you wish to classify these different vehicles or sections of man's constitution. Tonight we want to compare uh, the departments of the mental body and we want to ask why in the um, Hindu system the mind was considered as totally and completely separate from the emotions entirely contrary to Western psychology. The reason being to the ancient Hindus as we know that through their personal examination of the extrasensory perceptions by extrasensory perceptions they learned that the vortices or centers of energy in the mental and emotional fields went in opposite directions. Therefore these could not be merely conditions of each other. They had to represent purely and completely separate vehicles of manifestation. To this uh, consideration they also added the basic purpose or energy pattern behind the two fields. Essentially uh, the field of kama or desire is fulfilled through the purification of desire and its transmutation into the principle of pure love. Uh, the regeneration and redemption of the mental body consisted in its transmutation from thought and opinion and sense to the substance of pure reason. Now the difference between love and reason may be difficult to define but it is essentially valid and we recognize this in the difference between intellectualism and emotionalism as these two forces operate in our daily lives. The principle of emotion is moved on the foundation of desire. The principle of reason is moved on the foundation of research or the search for insight. The end of reason is the possession of fact. The end of emotion is to be possessed by the object of desire. These differences the Muslim mystics very quickly differentiated and they realized that while these two vehicles are seldom to be examined separately 
and cannot be considered as having a separate existence during physical life, that they do represent two principles in the structure of man, and that these two principles have different essential destinies to fulfill. Also, that the mental body was individualized in man, whereas it is not individualized in the animal. If the two were merely parts of one body, uh, then we would be justified in the Darwinian concept that man is merely the most intelligent of the animals. Uh, the Hindus will not accept that. They do not believe that man and the animal are identical creations of which one has advanced more than the other. They insist that this differentiation occurred archetypally and that the human species is not merely an outgrowth of the animal kingdom, although Indian philosophy will not deny that the physical bodies of man have an, or have an animal origin. Man became man when a rational principle was introduced by the lords of mind, and this introduction sets man apart. Uh, this is implied by the very term man himself. Well, this is one of the many English words that have a curious root and affinity in Eastern languages. It is interesting that in Indian philosophy, Manas is the name for mind. Also, that Manu was the great lawgiver. And uh, these uh, ideas also are carried in the concept of Manes, uh, the famous Manichean teacher, whose name signified the intellect of the world. Thus man's name, as man, means the thinker, means the mind born. And his cognition and his power implies in the book of Genesis that man, Manus, the Adam, was given dominion over the animals and told to bestow upon each its proper name. And he named them according to their kinds. And by naming, is implied in the ancient text understanding or discovering the true and essential nature of things. And it is this discovery of the true and essential nature which is the peculiar labor of mind. In modern psychology we know, for example, that the confusion of the emotional mental principle in diagnosis has and uh, does lead to some very difficult and sometimes disagreeable results. If, for example, in analysis, we release more of the emotional energy or psychic libido than the individual is able to control by mental energy. If, therefore, he is unable to rationalize the release which is made, only a Pandora's box is opened, and the patient may be more in more difficulty than he was before. We must, therefore, recognize that the administration of man was a compound being has been vested primarily in the mental principle, and that where this principle for any reason is unable to function adequately, we have confusion and difficulty in the personality. Now we also want to bear in mind that each body of man's involved chain of vehicles, each body is manifested especially and directly through the body next inferior to itself the subtle always manifesting through the grosser, the grosser never manifesting through the more subtle. It is therefore possible uh, that in man's function during life the emotional principle is always seen or known with the mental energy embedded within it. In other words, the mind functions through the emotional structure. The mind cannot be discerned objectively apart from the psychic field in which it operates. Yet it is not completely true that the mind and this psychic field are identical. But man, turning within himself, looking for mind, sees first its garment, uh, which is the emotional body. And within this emotional body, throned in the deepest and most subtle recesses of it, the principle of mental energy. Thus it might well be termed the Merkava of the ancient uh, Kabbalists, the chariot of ecstasy. 
For it is this mysterious emotional principle, the Shekinah of the ancient Jewish law, that goes before the Lord in glory, representing the vestment, veil, or appearance through which the mental power is able to manifest or release itself. Uh, recognizing these as essentially the teachings of certain legitimate schools, we cannot, under the limitation of time that we have, try to reconcile all of the details. But we must begin our study of the Manas principle as it applies uh, to our major theme, which constitutes the body sequence. The mental body of man is composed of very subtle material, which has been called mentoids. They are units of mental energy, equivalent to mental molecules. And these subtle materials, like the cells of the human body, gather together on their own plane of vibration to form an extremely attenuated instrument, an instrument which in man at the present time is not completely developed, an instrument which, therefore, does not reveal nearly the integration which we find in the emotional body. The mental body is usually depicted as a kind of aureole or halo surrounding the head and shoulders or the upper part of man. This mental body, of course, does actually permeate all parts of the physical form through extension and through the connective ethers which we have already mentioned. But in its grosser and more apparent form, still, however, very attenuated, it is recognized or known largely through this aureole of light, this haze of a golden color which surrounds the upper part of man and in which certain vortices or pinwheel-like cycles of moving energy may be noticed or apperceived. Uh, this mental principle, or mental body carrying the mental principle, is divisible into three parts, of which the lowest is referred to as the Kama Manus. And the Kama Manus is the mind of desire or that part of the mental energy which, extending directly downward, becomes almost immediately involved in the kamic principle, or becomes more or less the servant of desire. Uh, Buddhism has much to tell us about this particular phenomenon. But we know that mind, in a mysterious way, as the governor, must govern three worlds because all things exist in three primary states. Just as on the piano, we have the natural tone, and then it's sharp and it's flat. So in the case of man's mental nature, the mind natural, or the natural tone, is placed between two opposing polarities. The lower polarity extending downward into body through the camera the, or desire form the middle part remaining entirely aloof, being itself, or the pure principle of intellect. The upper part ascending upward, called the Arupa Manas, which is verging higher and towards the creativity of Buddhic intuition. Thus the mind has a considerable gamut of energies, resources, and responsibilities and the mental body must activate and maintain all of these processes. Uh, the descent of the mind or mental body into union with karma makes available what uh, Buddhism would call the illusionary mind, or what would be referred to in Vedanta, or perhaps Christian science, as mortal mind. It is mind moving downward into the illusion of matter. It is mind blinded like Samson and bound to the millstone of the Philistines. It is mind uh, called in some systems concrete mind. That type of mind which is geared to all of the objective purposes of the mortal objective nature. Therefore the individual who has a mighty stratagem for the making of a million dollars is working very hard uh, with the principle of the Kama Manas, or Kama Manas. He is objectifying the mental energy 
He is leading it downward into the gratification of his desire for a million dollars. For that reason, mind is captured by desire and held and becomes the slave of desire and begins the long and elaborate process of trying to satisfy desire or to fulfill the innumerable insistences of the emotional nature. Emotion causes man to want something. He then never rests until by the ingenuity of the camera manus he is able to secure that which he desires. In this process of struggling desperately for the gratification of the sensory perceptions, we have a key to the Buddhist doctrine of the skandhas or the links by which man is bound to an illusional existence. Uh, the uh, Kama Manas also uh, fulfills itself in the gratification of ambition, of possession, and uh, is the root of defense and escape reflexes within the psychic organism. One of the duties of this uh, faithful servant of desire is to protect the very desire structure with which it has become involved. Therefore, we find in psychology, in working with those who are in psychological difficulties, a tremendous ingenuity in which the mind seems to deliberately frustrate the work of the therapist. This is because the desire continues to desire itself, demand its own fulfillment, and because it has no actual orientation on the level of what is necessary or good. Thus, in the undeveloped person, to which we are referring, the uh, Kamamanus becomes buried or absorbed or engulfed in the illusion. And in this condition, it goes on to produce the entire development of what we call an objective materialistic culture. For it is mind bound to unregenerate desire which causes materialism. It also causes the innumerable intensities of hatred, fear, suspicion, and immediately spins webs of apparent reason around these things causing the individual to justify, to excuse, to condone, and sometimes have a quick and ready explanation for that which still remains untrue. Bound thus, linked thus, with the principle of desire, mind, or the mental principle, is comparatively powerless to serve the original purpose for which it was intended. The second level of mind uh, consists of the middle zone, for the mental body, like all of the others, is not only divided into an upper, middle, and lower part, but into a septenary, consisting of three lower levels, a central level, and three higher levels. Thus, each body becomes a microcosm or symbolic miniature of the entire structure. The mind, of course, is bound through the mental body to the brain, because of the intellectual or mental ether, which is one of the four divisions of the etheric double or vital body. And it is seated within seven peculiar vortex, vortex centers within the great structure of the brain. For within the brain of man is also a complete septenary of vortices and vital points. And in this septenary, the pineal gland occupies the position of the sun forming a minute solar system around which through the ventricular orifices uh, the orbits of the ancient planets move in their magnetic fields. So the pr principle of individuality is held to be that part of man's mind by which he is peculiarly and uniquely man. Because the Hindus and the Greeks and the Egyptians and the Chinese and nearly everyone else for that matter uh, was convinced that man is not man because his thoughts are fulfilled on the level of desire. Man is primarily man because he is master of himself. And the attainment of equilibrium, the rescuing of mental energy from any purpose 
different from itself. It is therefore the peculiar concern of the fourth or central zone of the mental body. Here we have pure mental energy, available only for when through various activities, particularly the use of the mind in the regeneration of its own structure and its doctrinal effect on the regeneration of the emotions and various circumstances arising from experience and on the emotional level religious or mystical devotion when for one reason or another the emotional nature relinquishes its authority over the mind becoming as in the ancient scriptures the handmaiden of the Lord then the emotions become available as means for the fulfillment of the purposes of mind but this is an exceedingly rare occurrence and for all practical purposes in the average human being the mind principle is still under the tyranny of unregenerate desire particularly celebrated in its most basic form, selfishness, from which man has a long way to go in the majority of cases. And so confused is his picture that one of the ways in which he is most selfish is often in his desperate effort to be unselfish. It is a very complicated and difficult substance to attain. Now what would we say would be the nature of mind entirely apart from any involvement Actually, probably, the nearest thing that we could say would be to give the old definition that was supposed to be on the gates of an ancient temple, namely, man, know thyself. This term is also attributed to Socrates. Therefore, essentially, the nature of mind, per se, is the self-knower. By the self-knower, we mean the mind's ability to examine and analyze the nature of the egoic vortex, which is located in the midst of it. Well, what man calls essential selfhood, or his existence as a sentient individual being, is posited on the fourth or central zone of the mental body, and is usually visible there as a ring of light the mysterious ring of the Nibelungen and the ring of the gods. This ring of light represents uh, the selfhood of man, the psychological entity or the focal point of all the attributes and attitudes and aptitudes which make up individuality. It is therefore the essential duty of the mind to analyze the nature of self. And in making this analysis, to discover that part of self which is an illusion, to discover the relationship between self and reality, and to come to the final Buddhistic conclusion that the ego, sattva, or personal self is not the reality, but actually, basically, and inevitably, as the Gita tells us, it is the slayer of the real. Thus. As one old philosopher has said, the grand purpose of the mind is the realization of disillusionment. In other words, it is the mind which finally tells us that we are not as good as we think we are and never will be. It is the mind which at the end of knowledge finally discovers that it knows nothing. Socrates on one occasion is reported to have said, that he was the wisest man in Athens because he was the only man in Athens who knew that he was a fool. Now this might sound like a symbolic exaggeration, but in principle, the point, though perhaps overdramatized in my statement, is essentially true. Namely, that until man, by means of the mind or the intellect, recovers from the hypnosis of intellectual existence, he is going to be bound forever if not in servitude to desire, he will be bound in servitude to, to, to egoism, which is not much better. And of all egoism or egotism, the primary impulse is the desire to exist, or the desire to be, or the desire to survive. 
This, then, is to Buddha the greatest of all the illusions. Now, it isn't simply that the principle of, in of intelligence or individuality is merely to discover this negative and pathetic point about its own existence. There is more to the story than this. Actually, the individual rescues himself by discovering the fact about himself. He releases the mind from first the bondage of emotion and desire, and secondly from the autocracy of ego. Now, the mind itself has an apperceptive range, and the mental body is therefore divided into zones capable of supporting the uses of energy, just as the physical body has veins and nerves and arteries and tissues because of the various energies that are necessary to maintain it. So the mental body has various degrees of substance within it suitable for the dissemination and distribution of the various qualities of mental energy. The point of intellection or individuality is climaxed by the individual's self-analysis and his final re recognition of the incredible limitation imposed for the concept of selfhood itself. He therefore gradually gains the possibility of intellectually transcending the fact of his own individuality. Now this may be getting a little confusing, so we'll pause and go back a little and start over again. But the, uh, the image is very definite. The man who is poor goes to the motion picture, spends an evening watching the foibles of the rich, and is thereby able to imagine a state different from his own. We can, because of numerous symbols and extensions of experience around us, imagine that which we have not factually experienced. This means that by imagination we can transcend the boundaries of the known. Now imagination is one of the contributions that the emotional nature makes to the mental problem of projection. And by means of the emotional quotient, now coming to the service of the intellect instead of becoming the master of it, we have the gradual integration of what has been termed the arupa manas, or the formless or higher creative mind. Now, when we say formless, we do not mean that the structure itself is formless. We mean, rather, that it is capable of the contemplation and consideration of formless ideas. In other words, the primitive man searching for a language first created symbolic pictures, and he could make pictures of houses and of horses and of birds. He, can, he could even draw a reasonable or unreasonable facsimile of himself. But it took a long time in the development of language before man could find uh, hieroglyphical devices to communicate ideas. He could make a house, but he couldn't draw a picture of good. He could make a fine study of an ancient dinosaur or some other uh, prehistoric monster on the, one of the cave walls in southern France. But he could not make a figure or drawing or representation of hope. Therefore he began to work out the problem of how to do this. He had trouble with verbs also because he was drawing pictures that did not move, representing action. The only way he could do it was to place his figures in an active posture. But action was one thing, he fought that out and came to some conclusions, but he still had a great deal to do in order to try to find out how to define pure beauty, for example. When he said, I want a thing to be beautiful, how could he make a picture of it? Well, probably in the beginning he had that kind of egoism which caused him to draw a picture of himself and establish that as the standard of beauty. In fact, today, 
among a great many races and peoples, their own racial type is the standard of beauty. But he had other problems. He could represent tangibles, but not intangibles. And his difficulty represented in very large measure the, gro the groping of his mind, moving from concrete to abstract. In order to develop beyond the point of primitive society, humanistic individual isolationism, the complete centering of energy upon self, in order to pass beyond that, man had to devise means to acquire the ability to create within himself certain patterns, symbols, or ideas which possess creativity. Now mind, being a single structure, basically, although divided into many parts, mind was not capable of solitary creative, creativity. Creation is always the union of a male and female polarity. So, through the union of the mind and the emotions, creativity became possible. And the mental body, through this union, gained the power of imagination, gained the powers of certain creative abstraction, and was able to operate analytically on such subjects as desire or faith. One of the earliest productions of this type of abstraction was religion, by which man gradually came to create an invisible world. It was even more powerful and more dominant than the visible one. Yet as a being he had never actually seen any of these things which he believed. Yet he knew with an internal certainty that they existed. Each human being in the process of growth, in the years between adolescence and maturity, recapitulates the entire cycle and must move toward individuality and through individuality to creativity. Creativity in maturity is biological, psychological, and spiritual. And if it is not all three, then it has failed to complete or perfect its own pattern. On the level of abstract mind, then, we find the gradual development of philosophies, of religions, of arts, the rise of great ethical institutions, the development of all of these dreams by which man, different from any other creature known to him, is able to lo long for, yearn after, and attain that which is different from his present state, and do so by his own energy. Had the animal world possessed this power, man could never have been master of the earth. If the animal had creativity on the psychic or psychological level, man could never have dominated the world. It would be the animal that would have built cities, instead of man, and would have defended them. But because man had this faculty, he has made himself lord of the creation that we know. Certainly, he is lord of it largely symbolically, because he actually dominates no part of it except that which is lesser than himself. Creativity, then, in the experience of the individual, produces certain changes in the structure of the mental body. We have told you that the etheric binders or bridges which unite the body objectively to the subjective superior principles behind it are two-way roads of communication and even sometimes of transportation. As surely as the mental energy Flowing downward into the personality enables man to bring certain order out of chaos in his environment and gives him ultimately perhaps judgment 
and the ability to control through reason the excesses and intensities of his appetites. At the same time, contact with the world and with the environmental universe around him carries its own messages back into the mental nature, causing a constant enrichment or inflowing of available resources. Thus the mind is strengthened by living, even as life is directed by the mind. And through learning and knowledge, we increase the powers of the mind, so that by training, by evolution, and by various processes, we may distinguish the gradual maturity of intellect. And according to conservative records, we say that history records up to the present time approximately 10,000 examples of what we might term mature mind. In other words, mind that has reached a degree in which it has no longer been forced to concern itself primarily with its own existence, but has transcended this and made creative contribution to the universal well-being of humanity. In this level, then, mind grows. The uh, Platonic school instructed disciples, learning penetrates into various parts of the mind according to the nature of the learning. That learning which is primarily for the maintenance of the personality and which may be heavily catering to the selfishness of a generation or a perspective at the time, naturally strengthens the relations between Manus and Kama and causes gradual development of ambition motives. The mind then begins to figure how it can advance the personal life of the external individual uh, through the use of the skill which it has gained. Therefore, we read the little ad in the paper. There's nothing wrong with the ad, but in the study of man's nature, it tells us something. Take our course and earn more money. The point is very simple. The project is uh, to inspire skill in order that the individual may improve his material condition. The motive then belongs on the Kama Manus level, <coughs> or the use of mind, or the improvement of mind for the fulfillment of desire. This level is not the only one upon which we function, however. And we know that there are many systems of knowledge which do emphasize the fact that by learning these things, you become a better person. This type of appeal is directed toward the fourth level, or the level of individuality. It is the seat of the intelligence principle located in the central part of the mind structure and also the throne or immediate environment of the ego. The development then of individuality by the mind means the training of the mind for its own sake. This is like on the physical plane uh, a certain type of person who gets up every morning and takes a two mile walk before breakfast. He is not going anywhere and he doesn't expect to arrive anywhere except back home again, but he certainly is developing a fine physique. He is exercising the body for the sake of the body. We may meet him so often on shipboard doing the five turns of the deck before breakfast and waking up everyone on the ship. <laughs> he is not doing this primarily because he enjoys it. He's not catering especially to uh, cameramanus. He is not doing it because actually it is going to serve anybody else. It is only going to disturb them. Therefore, he is not doing it for the sake of universal good. <laughs> he is doing it because he regards it as a helpful exercise or exercise for the sake of exercise. In the mind, we have the same type of problem. And when this is clearly defined, we have what we commonly term the pure intellectual. He is the individual learns from the love of learning, 
who enjoys new ideas for their own sake primarily, and whose life is best satisfied in the adventure of extending his mind into the unknown, not because he even expects to use what he learns for himself primarily, simply because he is an adventurer on a mental level. He lives to use the faculties that he has and rejoices in the fact that he possesses them. <clears throat> on an intellectual level also, these are the persons who very often become uh, what has been called uh, by David Starr Jordan the in impotent intellectual. He is the individual who knows a great deal but does nothing. He is the English teacher who can use every word in the language effectively, but has nothing to say. <laughs> he is the individual who has a magnificent instrument, which he has polished and perfected, but has not really learned any reason for having the instrument. It is simply wonderful and beautiful because it is his or the accumulator who gathers all kinds of things he does not want and does not need simply because of the joy of gathering them finding them and knowing that he has them this intellectual person is more or less of a discouragement to those around him because he is completely satisfied to think he finds his life as full of thinking as other people find it full of thoughtlessness. He is very much like the person who lives only to gratify his desires. It's a one-pointed program. And whether we're satisfying our love of thought or satisfying our appetites, the satisfaction represents a use which in itself is neutral. And being neutral is the weakest of all applications because it reminds us of that famous statement of what the Lord does to those who are neither hot nor cold. The mind, however, has above this level a further gamut of extension upward uh, into what has been sometimes called the Buddhi Manas or the Arupa. That is this motion into the world of idea mm -hmm. ideal. The mind gradually reaches the point in its ascent through the structure of its own nature in which its own reflections can no longer be held within the bounds of the mediocre. The mind cannot be stopped in growing. And as it grows out of its appetitive attachments into those of pure intellect, uh, which may be termed essential scholarship, and has many parallels to what we call the exact sciences, it then proceeds onward to the development of bridges of consciousness between itself and that which is next superior to itself. The very study of our world by a materialist will ultimately make an idealist out of it, no matter how hard he tries to prevent it. Uh, we will refuse to accept a negative statement on this because while it may not accompli be accomplished in one life and it might take him 25 lives to do it, any individual who is essentially a sincere star scholar will ultimately become an idealist. He can't help it because he can't stop himself. He can block himself through the period of a lifetime by closing his mind. He can frustrate the very motion of growth within him by taking a highly reactionary position and forcing this upon his own nature. But he cannot keep it up. Because the pressure of growth, like the pressure of the little root between the rocks, will ultimately break the stone. Nothing can prevent growth. So the very development of mind itself means inevitably that mind must escape from the obvious and begin the contemplation of that which is not obvious. The mind is so endowed that having established a certain point, it must adventure forth from that point, not only downward into lesser things, but upward into greater things. 
and by degrees the intellectual moves toward philosophy. He moves towards the rationalization of the universe. He moves from the realm of thought to the realm of idea. And as he does so, he gradually gains familiarity with this fear and discovers that ideas are a wonderful flexible material which can be molded and that he is living, possessing within himself faculties by which he can apperceptively know more than the mind can actually rationally reveal to him. So rationality which we like to consider to be the highest attribute of the mind, is that level which has accepted the reasonableness of certain things that cannot be immediately perceived. Rationality is orientation in a world of reason, whereas intellect is merely orientation in a world of facts. Man, having attained rationality, for example, recovers from the diseases that come from the absence of this quality. We are reminded of Bacon's famous definition of atheism. A little learning inclineth the mind to atheism, but greatness of learning bringeth the mind back again to God. Thus reason can accept God when intellect cannot. But in the process of achieving this, reason has rescued God from the thought forms imposed upon it by intellect. Thus, reason is forever justifying itself by redeeming false concepts about things presumably known or believed. When we come upon an idea superior to what we have, we may say that it is reasonable because it does not break the essential pattern of conviction but extends beyond the obvious. Reason then in the apperceptive power of the mind is that phase of the mind which is gradually orienting the individual in a universal existence rather than in a personal existence. We've already said that man has three possible orientations. Personal, objective. Individual, subjective. Universal, spiritual. And in these orientations, the purpose of reason is to move the mind gradually from the individual toward the universal. Now we might say that this then indicates uh, that the mind may be considered synonymous with the buddhi, which we will describe or discuss next week, and that the mind by extension, extension can attain a universal state. Actually, this is not true, because the mind cannot transcend the boundaries and limitations imposed by the vibratory substance of which it is composed and the mind cannot transcend the process of ratiocination. It cannot transcend the process of thinking. It can work that process over. It can attenuate it and refine it to almost inconceivable degrees. But the mind is the thinker. And the mind cannot survive the state of the suspension of thought. The thought process, when exhausted, brings with its termination the end of the mental existence. We sometimes use the analogy that is found in the Pentateuch relating to this. For we know that Moses, who represents the elder mind of Israel, was permitted to see the promised land, but he could not enter and was required to go to sleep in the hills of Moab. And Jehoshua the son of Nun led the children of Israel into the land of Canaan. Moses, the great lawgiver, the great teacher, 
the symbol perhaps of the great philosopher of Israel, could not enter into the promised land, which was symbolically the Sabbath of the Lord. He could not go in, because the mind cannot enter a state essentially superior to itself. Therefore, at the gates of a superior state, the mind must go to sleep and be gathered to its fathers. So man's mind, this upper gamut, which we call the Arupa Manas, is the gradually rising levels or zones of mental refinement that lead gradually from the first simple appreciation of finer things until the individual says, as uh, Mohammed is supposed to have said, had I two coats, I would sell one and buy white hyacinths for my soul. When man reaches this point, he is beginning to escape from the tyranny of collective mind or material mind. Other things are becoming more important to him. Uh, there has been a union between the refining and unfolding emotions and the mental principle. And from this union is being born the beautiful. <laughs> that which dedicates its energies and resources to these things which have inward and eternal significance. Also, we find that this type of mind begins to be more concerned with quality than with quantity, more concerned with attainment of value than recognition by others, and ever more dedicated uh, to those principles which invisible and unknown to the majority are still gradually unfolding within that being and becoming the most necessary things in the world of that being. Thus we see the gradual dedication to the tremendous expressions of creative genius. We find the same refinements taking place on the emotional level when the uh, Kama Rupa begins to be regenerated and one produces essentially the artist or ultimately the mystic, and the other, the mental, produces essentially the sage or the philosopher, and ultimately through this uh, process and through the union of the two, the, the philosopher and the mystic accomplishes the possibility of the apperception of total reality. But this apperception is not either of mind or emotion, but goes beyond them. But they build toward it, and in the gradual development of man, we see that the upper developments of the mind move towards the unselfish universal service of common good, the instruction of mankind, the disciplining and natural control of the personality itself, and a, a richly increasing and deepening appreciation of what constitutes essential value. All these things tell us that the being is using the higher phases of its vehicles. Now in the life cycle, after the entity, having passed out of incarnation, passes through uh, the two spheres of the Kamic world, namely Kamaloka or Purgatory, and Evachan or the Paradiso. It then ascends into the substance of its mental nature, which becomes the highest and final, final of its individual vehicles of expression. At this time, uh, the emotional or astral body is cast off. It is cast off after the records or the essential nature of the achievement has been incorporated into the superior vehicles. Having thus passed into the state of a mental existence, the entity is then 
polarized according to the degree of unfoldment that has been attained particularly first by the Kamarupa in the preceding embodiment. The desire mind or the mind of desire is its first introduction to a mental existence after death. Now the mental existence differs from the Kamalokic ex uh, different in this difference that whereas in Kamaloka punishments and rewards are in terms of feelings in the mental body punishments and rewards are in the terms of rationality in other words here the individual lives in a world of thoughts therefore this world as described to us in the vision of Aridius and others is no longer a world of wonderful houses and trees and mountains and fountains and all these things associated with the summer land of Andrew Jackson Davis in the mental level uh, the individual has the experience that we sometimes hear a very exceptional person describe when he says he had a beautiful evening with his own thoughts. That's a hard thing to do, by the way, because in most cases our thoughts won't support such a delightful experience. Usually our thoughts get a little out of hand. They are morbid and melancholy, full of regrets and memories. And I, here's the rub. The lower level or Kamarupic plane of the mind is the zone of intellectual memory. And here the individual has to have the experience of remembering. Now our memories are nice things when you can filter them out with your emotions and various screens and only remember exactly what you want to. Or perhaps memories can be very nasty things when you have very carefully filtered out all the good ones. You can do it either way. But in the after-death experience on the lower levels of the mental nature, the memories are just plain honest, which can be the most embarrassing of all. Here when you remember what horrible things other people did to you, you also remember with beautiful clarity exactly the nasty things you did to them. <laughs> it's not comforting, but oh, so educational. <laughs> On the plane of the mind, therefore, we examine all things concrete mental on the level of fact, abstract mental on the level of reality. Now it may possibly be that we were not distinguished during life for mentation and uh, therefore our mental existence is not a particularly complete one. We sometimes say that we are sure that many people have only had three or four thoughts in a lifetime and did very little about those. Remember exercise and use strengthens bodies whether they are visible or invisible. And if the mental life of the individual is inadequate, his mental existence in the mental body is correspondingly brief and inadequate. It would naturally then be assumed that the after-death mental state of the comparatively primitive human being would be shorter than that of the civilized man, it is. And barring the circumstances which do arise in which very highly evolved minds that have attained to the full height of reason may voluntarily return simply in service of their fellow men. We may say that what we would term today the great illumined teacher would have so vast an after-death mental existence that uh, it would be a great time before in the cycle of evolution he would normally return to embodiment. Thus a Bushman or a Digger Indian might be back in a year or two from the uh, mental level. But of course he would be longer on the uh, Devachanic or Kamalokic planes. He would have a long emotional existence perhaps. But not as long as that of the mature 
emotional being who has had a great deal of intensity in living because the primitive person lives in a great acceptance and therefore does not stimulate either emotional or mental conflict. But presuming then that the life of the aborigine on the mental plane would be mostly the contemplation of observation and an integration of things seen in daily living about which only the most in rudimentary reflection existed. In the case of a man like Plato, this exhaustion of the mental world might require in the normal course of time 10,000 or years. This is due to the tremendous amount of internal mental life that is stored up, and also the fact that the after-death purpose is not new experience, but the incorporation of experience into the consciousness of the person, of the being. Let us, for instance, say, just as a simple example of this, that you are reading the Holy Scripture, and you are, uh, you are simply a good and devout believer. So you read a parable, and you interpret it to yourself as you would interpret it to your child, a fine ethical message. And that exhausts it. But if you at that time of your study happened to be one of the old sages of Israel, for example, one of the great assembly of the old Sanhedrin, your first realization would be that this parable has 72 meanings. Every line word of scripture, according to them, has six times twelve interpretations that every letter and every word of that parable by Notorikon and Gamatria could be exchanged and reversed. The text could be rebuilt and rewritten a hundred, five hundred, a thousand ways. And therefore, that gradually, out of the one text, you could evolve a work perhaps running into more pages than the entire Bible you can realize that the amount of thought, the amount of contemplation, the amount of time required for the digestion of that which by reminiscence is brought to the awareness out of the self by the text would depend upon your scholarship. The more you know, the more you are, the more everything means to you. Thus, an individual who, like we will say again for our purposes, Plato, who reached the philosophic age, who had attained a long and useful life, coming to the 81st year, in that lifetime experienced many times more than we experience, because every event was more meaningful and also more instructive. He probably knew more of his mistakes than we could possibly know of ours. And so gradually, the reorganization, the extraction of the total meaning of every thought, every word, every decision, every contact, every relationship, in terms of essential wisdom, would be a very difficult and different problem from that which we would face. And because of that, these periods of assimilation differ according to the qualities and attributes of the person. Obviously also in mind like Plato, Plato or perhaps even, Socrates, uh, even Aristotle, although uh, to a somewhat lesser degree, because his mind was very much more on the fourth level of pure intellect. This departmentizing of mind the mind of a Pythagoras ascending to, through consciousness he was aware of the universal harmony of the spheres a mind of that caliber would have its greatest extension of conscious existence in the higher levels of the mental plane whereas perhaps a very wonderful statistician an individual who had a very skillful and clever intellect, sharply used, highly trained, but not creative, 
would have a greater endurance and a greater period of existence on the level of concrete mind, the lower plane. Now in mind, we no longer have the problem that we had in the Devachanic planes, namely heaven and hell. We no longer have reward and suffering. There is no longer acute pain because the mind does not suffer as the emotions do. The mind accepts, analyzes, and passes through the simple and severe state of being right or wrong. It is no longer a matter of regret because if it's regret it goes right back to the emotional again. The mind is educated or unfolded, seeing that which is so and that which is not so. Thus punishment on the mental level is the recognition of the error of judgment. It is the realization that the thought was incorrect. Reward on the same level is the recognition of the essential validity of the position taken by the mind. And gradually through the reorganization of context by the memory faculty, which is located in the cerebellum and is isolated from the other parts of the brain, through the memory faculty, the individual has available to him the complete text. He has it in a way that we cannot have it in our daily living because we are not sufficiently acute in our thinking. But through the complete text, the mind has available complete context. That is, the inevitable relationships between cause and effect the consequences of an effect, the inevitable outcome of decision, the continuous sequences by which we become aware of the ultimate consequence of any given action. These things, by review, perfect the mind in its accuracies and in its judgments. And on the level of fact, the lower part of the mental plane, the mind is led to factuality, the ability to conquer opinion and to arrive at judgment. The higher level carries the mind power and the mind process to realization of reality or to the higher degree of reason. Here the mind becomes indoctrinated or aware of the validity of the reasonable over the factual. The things which are reasonable may be more true than those things which are factual. The things factual may be unreasonable. And the things reasonable may be unfactual. This is something that we cannot judge from our perspective. But the mind extending itself towards the superior moves more and more into the creative sphere of pure reason. And as it does so, it is enriched by an attribute that we do not suspect. The one thing that we often associate with the mind and by which we depreciate it is the idea that it's supposed to be a very cold, calculating, heartless, feelingless instrument largely given to the process of making other people uncomfortable with unrequested advice. <laughs> Actually, in its higher creative aspects, the mind is not cold. Reason is not dull, dry, colorless. In its own and essential nature, reason is ascending gradually to a state superior to itself. It is moving just as nearly all great scholars, great philosophers have moved towards something superior to that which was originally 
understood. Either historically or symbolically, depending on how we want to look at it, and how much we want to trust the ancient writers, especially Xenophon, it would seem uh, that the life of Plato was created to express this ascent. Because, as you will remember, he began life with an devout desire to be a politician. He was convinced that what Athens needed was good government, and he was ready to get out and stump for it. He, he started and he went along for a while, and then he came to the conclusion that good government was impossible unless there were good people to run it. And that while the governed and the governing were both selfish and ignorant, good government could not be attained. So he departed from politics and became a philosopher. And he set up his school, the academy, for the purpose of training men in governing themselves on the grounds that no one who could not govern himself could govern anybody else. You see what we have accomplished now? We have moved from uh, the Kamarupa, here the concept of good government, or the emotional desire to improve men in spite of themselves, and have uh, Plato now moving to the middle zone of individuality for the purpose of teaching them how to govern and understand themselves, which is the peculiar purpose of the focal point of individuality. Here he remained for a number of years. And here, of course, during this period, he came in contact with Aristotle, and the two were friends for many years, but finally separated when Plato went into the third cycle of his life. When in the last 10 or 15 years of his physical existence, he turned away from teaching as he had previously taught and moved from philosophy to theology. He became concerned primarily with the aspects of higher mysticism. And it was here that Aristotle could not follow him. For Plato discovered, as he himself tells us in his writings, that the contemplations of pure reason had drawn him inevitably toward the adoration of the fountain of reason, that through his gradual ability to honestly estimate life, either human or universal, he had come inevitably to the recognition of the great sovereign principle from which all life descended. Through reason, he had come to a rational contemplation of the divine. Now, he couldn't have done it on the mental level had he not passed through philosophy. If he had done it on the emotional level, he would have passed through the ecstasy or sublimation of mysticism. But in, on the philosophical level, he became a great rational mystic. For he began to contemplate the entire world of knowledge as existing for only one purpose, that through it was revealed the workings of the one which is eternal. Thus reason became only the handmaiden of truth. And beyond the mind and all that it could engender was the infinite being, the substance of all things, the end of all seeking. Now we do not know that Plato achieved what Plotinus did through his mystical union. But we do know that he did attain that purpose which fulfills or culminates the career of mind. He reached that point in which he stood on the mountain and looked forth into the promised land. He had made the long and dangerous journey. He had passed through the dark night of the soul. And he had come to the point where wisdom had revealed to him the absolute certainty of truth. Now when wisdom has accomplished this, the mind has fulfilled itself. The mind can do no more. 
it can never do anymore. Therefore, the mind must gradually sublimate. Now, with man, the mind cannot sublimate at this time in his cycle of evolution and still permit him to have a conscious existence. Because at this time, his individuality as a being is located in the middle zone of the mental nature. Therefore, when he has exhausted his own mental life, whatever that may be, he then must pass into sleep. Because if he casts off this body, he has no vehicle of manifestation remaining. So when the mental essences of experience, reflection, meditation, are transferred into the egoic vortex, it means that the skandhas have delivered all of their testimonies back into the sattva or ego. And there it remains like the famous Ark of Noah, floating over the deep, carrying within itself the seeds and principles of many lives to come. Thus the entity or the being, having achieved its purpose, retires to sleep. The mental body is cast off, having exhausted its potential. And beyond this, the individual must rest or sleep until the new vehicles of manifestation are objectified. So having exhausted the complete totality of mind, the individual is in possession of something else. The records of each body are transferred according to a sequence of superiority to the superior bodies in each case. Therefore, when the mental body reaches the totality of its manifestations and has drawn back into itself the sukatmas or seeds of the other bodies, the mental body then possesses the power of rationalizing the total pattern of the life cycle that it has experienced. It may gaze down, so to say, or outward, into the fields of desire, energy, and form, and unite all of their testimonies by judgment. It therefore is in the position, perhaps, to accomplish certain things. One is to have a fair picture of total success and failure, or the degree of achievement that has been attained, as against the degree of achievement yet to be attained. It also is then empowered because of its virtue, because of its integration, to decide to some degree, according to its maturity, those parts of the problems of growth which it wishes to next assume. Thus being in a position, if it has reached a certain degree of individuality, of determining certain incidents or grand patterns or broad purposes of future embodiments. Having thus achieved this orientation, uh, the mind relinquishes its hold and goes to sleep. The mental body uh, does not die as we know it. It simply fades out, disintegrates by the process of exhausting, exhausting the energies which it contains or else exhausting the conscious experiences which can be rescued from it when there is nothing left in it then it is finished. It no longer can stimulate activity and the individual passes into quiescence, awaiting future embodiment. In the Buddhistic doctrine, we then find this problem of the bridge which extends above the individuality which is the focus of selfhood and extends up into the buddhic manasic field which is the field of the enlightened mind. In Buddhism manifestation above the level of individuality can only occur to the degree that individuality itself is reduced. The self being the focal point of the axis of the wheel of rebirth 
Rebirth is a cycle from the self to the self and cannot be broken while it begins and ends in the self. The buddhic, therefore, or the higher phases of mind, are reflections of what might be termed the overtones, or selfless reason. Now, what, what is selfless reason? It's a hard word to think about, even let alone define. We're not any of us awfully good at it, you know, and it's not something with which we have a much experience. We have a certain sense of it, however, in certain occasions, when we say that an individual is absorbed in an idea. We have occasions, even on our objective life, in which we think without knowing that we think and that we have thoughts without these thoughts being directly associated to ourselves. They are rare, and they are not as common as we think, because nearly always when we break thoughts down, we do find a little selfish, subtle something in there that is tied to self. But it is conceivable that it is possible for the person to think a selfless thought. This would mean that he is using the mind above the level of the sattvic focus. Now if after death he has built these superior strata of the mental body to any appreciable degree, he cannot function in them on a sattvic level, that is, when the self goes to sleep, which it does with a loss of individuality, then the overtones are experienced by this being, the sattva, as a kind of overtone of dream in the sleep of death. And in this sleep of death what dreams shall come? The sattva going to sleep at the end of the mental life may be capable, under certain conditions, of an apperceptive experience above its own selfhood. This is the beginning of a new body and a new quality function. At this time, it is still on the mental level, because it is still like a psychological uh, experience in relation to man's objective nature. Although he may psychologically have a vision of being in heaven, he is not there. He is functioning psychologically on a level of apperception within himself, but it is within him. The same is true if on the mental level the individual has an extension into what is called buddhic experience. This buddhic experience is an overtone of inspiration, a powerful development of what we call the intuitive faculty, but intuitive in the sense of an overtone of thought, not a completely pure intuition. So that if the individual has developed, as we might say a person like Pythagoras might have developed, a tremendous, abstract, intuitive apperception of divine things, rationally conceived, but at the same time essentially valid. In other words, if this intuitive apperception is true, then the individual has the possibility of a dreamlike extension of himself into a state superior to selfhood. And by so doing, to become aware of or conscious with the universal principle of manas or universal mind. For we must realize that the seventh or highest level of each body is its link with the universal substance of which that body is composed. Thus the seventh level upward of the emotional body 
is its link with the pure substance of universal laws. The seventh or highest link of the mental body is its contact with the pure substance of universal mind. Thus we have references to universal mind, uh, to the possibility of man experiencing it. It is still mind, but man may extend under certain conditions into higher levels of mind than the level upon which the ego is integrated. But this is man outreaching himself upward. It is a position which he cannot maintain consistently because it is unnatural to him. It's like trying to be better than you are all the time. It simply won't hold up. You can have big moments, but if you do, you're going to have some weak ones soon after. So this problem is too abstract to maintain that the individual may have apperceptive awareness of it, just as he may have objectively intuitional apperception of states of being or consciousness superior to himself. All growth, of course, is through arcs of apperception. And the individual who has just finished the addition in school has already had an arc of apperception toward multiplication and has a hunch about what it is going to be like. Thus he is able to bridge across because he has built an arc of apperception. A man in his mental life reaching toward that which is beyond mind creates these arcs which give him a certain subtle awareness of what is to follow. This gives us then the introduction to the link of the, between Manus as intellect and Buddhi as the principle of pure universal illumination, which is not intellect, but is beyond intellect and corresponds with the positive pole of the world soul. Now the problem relating to that will be gone into in the next discussion, but we want to get down now to a few uh, more or less relevant details tying some of these ideas to more familiar subjects. If we realize then that the mind, the mental body, can never be perceived objectively except in its pattern of sequence with the emotional and vital bodies, and that these flow outward through the physical centers of distribution to become our objective selves. Then if we look at man inwardly at any time, we will see the mind only through the vital principle, which is one veil before it, and the emotional principle, which is another vestment upon it. Thus, in any moment when we examine man, we can perfectly well assume that his transcendental nature consists of a mind-emotion unity. Just as we look into the heavens and we see what are called twin stars, and we call them that because they are so close together, when actually they are billions of miles apart. Thus, because of our inability to estimate qualitative interval, we cannot realize that things in juxtaposition are not necessarily close together. The mind, then, when examined psychologically, is assumed to be in constant and immediate sympathy or relationship with the emotions, and both tied together into a pattern. Actually, the so-called psychological diseases of the mind are due to ignorance and those of the emotions to excess, and they are not the same thing. Yet, ignorance may lead to excess, and excess may sustain ignorance. And in the study of a case history, it is not always simple to distinguish these elements or these factors. The growth of man, psychologically considered, must therefore always be a recognition that a different therapy is required for the emotions than is required for the mind, and that there is nothing more fatal than to throw these two into mutual conflict in the hope of neutralizing a difficult situation. 
And that is a very, very common thing to do. One of the simplest expressions of such conflict is to tell the individual who is under emotional stress that he should think it out. He can think forever. He will not solve it. Or to tell someone who is under heavy mental stress that what he should do is go out and enjoy himself. There are a number of other incorrect diagnoses that arise from this particular type of thing. Uh, one is the belief, for example, that if you let your feelings go, uh, the mind will relax. Or if you think good, solid thoughts, your emotions will collapse under the pressure of them and become nicely disciplined and in inhibited little creatures. The only way the mind can control the emotions actually, by control, is through tyranny of some kind, autocracy, or through the energy of the will, which is the basis of it. The mind can say, don't do it, like a parent who is a little exasperated with a small boy. Maybe the boy will stop and maybe he won't, but his virtues do not necessarily multiply even if he stops. <laughs> He may be merely biding his time for a better opportunity. We also know that the idea of trying to rescue the mind simply by the stimulation of emotional impulse will not solve the matter either. We cannot play the two against each other. And that is one of the reasons why a good many systems of psychotherapy are not more successful. What we have to do is recognize the inalienable rights of both and to realize that normalcy or equilibrium is bringing these two onto sympathetic levels of common function. You can never be so wise that your wisdom will take the place of emotional balance. And you can never so be so magnificently emotionally balanced that it will cure ignorance. Each of these things has to solve, be solved on its own level. The problem of creating a partnership or of arbitrating differences and recognizing the importance of rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, etc., is the only solution. The uh, psychotic problems of mankind stem from two sources, mental and emotional. And these may be compounded to create emotional mental or mental emotional difficulties. But primarily, in almost every instance, the uh, cause, the dynamic cause, uh, is one of these two, and the other is a subordinate or secondary contributing cause. It is very rare that the mind and the emotions are equally guilty in any particular situation, because there is no particular situation in nature in which both have equal authority. In every situation, one or the other has priority. Therefore, the priority determines the basic cause. If the cause is mental, then it is necessary that the material problem be handled, not by bringing the emotions blindly and crudely, like some rough chemical formula out of the pharmacopoeia, which treated one ailment with a certain medication and no other but to recognize that normalcy must be established on both of these levels and that their final union must be voluntary and that their cooperation must be mutual or else the union will never be productive. We find this even in the animal kingdom where forced mating is usually a failure. There must be the voluntary cooperation of the two factors in order to produce 
the integration which is almost the child of the mind and heart. If these two are not brought into proper order, then they will not function. Emotions mature through release under suitable conditions. The mind matures by direction under suitable incentives. And where these two necessary elements are provided, the remedies become permanent. Whereas otherwise, symptoms may be temporarily cleared away, but because the causes are not removed, the individual simply falls into another problem. If, for example, his mind is not strong enough to correct his emotional excesses and integrate them on the level of understanding, any emotional excess for which a remedy is found will only give rise to another, because the individual cannot protect the state of normalcy. He doesn't know how. If, on the other hand, the mental nature is inadequate, the emotions made through stimulation try to supply or supplement the deficiency, but they cannot do so. And no amount of sincerity in all the world can prevent the inadequate mind from getting itself and others into trouble. This is the grand story of personal affection. We may love profoundly, but if we do not love wisely, very little is accomplished. So everywhere in these problems there is a partnership which must be voluntary. Neither the emotions nor the mind can attain a state of health independent of each other. Yet neither can save the other, because each, strangely enough, must save itself. But in saving itself it becomes the guide and protector of the other on a basis of mutual security. The emotions are referred to, and have been referred to, as being the source of the soul. And here again we have had some problem because in psychology the soul is regarded as both mental and emotional. But in the Eastern system, the soul actually represents not the total psychic life of man as in Western thinking, but essentially the emotion quotient, which is consummated and summated in the concept of the universal love of God. In other words, the soul represents the heart of God in the meaning of the great psychic sensitivity of deity to the need of its creation. The mind represents the intellect of deity and the archetypal plan which is created and sustained by reason in the divine mind. Therefore, actually, uh, the mind represents the dispensation of law and the heart the dispensation of grace. Now, we grace and law have been turned against each other more than once. But actually, grace tells us that through complete love, man discovers the perfection of the law. Loving deity for the lawfulness of God. For the law is not only the great good, but the greatest kindness, the greatest beauty. For justice, integrity, and reason are the most kindly of all things, because they alone are truthful. In the same way, the law discovers the mystery of grace, and grace is the natural fulfillment of the law. For the law, accomplishing all things through wisdom, accomplishes them in beauty, and discovers through the evolution of man, who is the embodiment of law, that all the processes of the universe are revealed through beauty, and therefore that beauty is the symbol of the perfect good, 
even as law is the emblem of the eternal one. The one and the good and the beautiful are likewise one. Now in the psychological life of man these things are also true. As the mind rules in the sphere of reason or of law and the heart in the sphere of mercy or of grace. Surely these two work together. They are necessary but they are not the same. They represent a pair of perceptive powers by means of which man accomplishes a stereoscopic consciousness toward life. Thus in ancient times they were assigned to the right and left eye. For by these two eyes man becomes aware of himself and nature, but the eyes are not one, but through their union of vision is achieved what cannot be accomplished by either alone. And through the heart and mind and the vehicles for which they represent, or which they represent, man is able to attain a perspective relating to himself and nature and the causal universe from which he is suspended. Now there are a great many things to talk about, but I think we've done enough for this evening.